For our next keynote um, address, a very interesting person. He's the founder and managing partner at uh, VADS Inc., a professional advisory. Wa What's that? WADS. There you go. That's how you pronounce it, ladies and gentlemen, of WADS Inc. Um, decades of experience, both in public relations and in corporate communications, held senior leadership positions in companies such as um, Weber, Shandvik, Ketchum. And uh, Amit, help me out. It is uh, Metia. Michia, that's the company he's worked with. Interestingly, our next keynote speaker is a lifelong learner. He's currently doing his doctorate um, at the Leeds University Business School, where he's researching interesting topic, very relevant to today's session, on the future role of public relations in management. And that's exactly the topic that he's going to speak on. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Stephen Waddington. Thank you, Stephen. Hello. Thanks for the introduction. It's Wadzink, um, but I like Wadzink as well. Um, it's so wonderful to be here. This conference and the World PR Forum before it has blown my mind, just the, the, the commitment to professional development and learning in this room, 600 practitioners. Um, it, it's, it's just absolutely fantastic. And I want to thank their practice team for its hospitality and the kind invitation to speak today. My goal over the next um, half an hour is to talk about the relationship between public relations and management. My lifetime goal, the legacy from my career, I want to, to, to be that, that role of public relations in management. I bring with me three perspectives. So I've worked as a public relations practitioner for 30 years, mainly in the ag agency side, although I now run a professional advisory firm working with comms teams and agencies. I spent 10 years as a teacher and writer. Um, my most recent book written with Professor Dr. Ralph Tench is shown on the screen, Exploring Management Communications. And most recently, um, I've started studying a doctorate where I'm um, investigating the contribution of public relations to, to management. And that's what I want to talk to you today. Um, we've got a lot to cover, and I hope I'll, I'll bring you with, with me as I go. Um, it's a real privilege to be here and learn from you, because so much of the discourse in theory and practice in public relations comes from a Western viewpoint. And the, the perspective of the global south is so frequently overlooked. And it's absolutely brilliant to see that changing. Public relations has never been so critical as a management function. I want to talk to you about the con con contribution of public relations to management. It's an issue that I've been looking at for, for 10 years. I was president of the CIPR in the UK in 2014. And that's when I first saw the opportunity. My view is that to make the optimal contribution to society and to an organization, public relations must be part of management. A public relations perspective of organizations, as we've heard from previous speaker, is invaluable in helping management to navigate contemporary issues. We live, as we heard yesterday, in a VUCA world characterized by volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. In fact, um, it's interesting, a, a colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Anne Gregory, has added a D to that acronym, acronym for deceitful in her latest book. Um, there's five macro issues have arisen at the moment, creating a situation that publications from The Economist to the Indian Express have called a permanent permacrisis, the permanent state of crisis. And these relate to society, the environment, artificial intelligence, and misinformation. I want to address each of these quickly. And my route into this area was during COVID, during the pandemic. I helped convene a community of practitioners, senior healthcare practitioners in NHS trusts in the north of England. I also recorded many of the stories of the roles of professional communications for the UK government. In every instance during that period, public relations was elevated to the highest levels within an organization. Within a healthcare setting, it was part of Gold Command, it became part of emergency response. 
within private sector practitioners were promoted to board positions and helped manage radical change to supply chains and workflow. The elevation of public relations during this time led to the conversations that I started at Leeds Business School. And it turns out that public relations in management is surprisingly under-researched in academia. We, academia instead is focused on the sociological and the societal perspectives. Meanwhile, in practice, we constantly reinvent the wheel. At least that's the story over my career and my life experience. The same issues arise in practice year after year, and we never seem to learn from past mistakes. In fact, it's been fantastic to go back to school, literally, and back to the fundamentals of research and explore the relationships between public relations and management. And we heard yesterday about issues related to populism in the political sphere in India. We've also seen this in the last 48 hours in the UK with climate change announcements. The rise of populism and nationalism in politics creates major challenges for public discourse. Populists use simplistic emotional messaging that resonates with supporters but lacks nuance on complex issues. They foster distrust of experts and institutions and they make informed debate really difficult. They rely on personal charisma and emotion over substantive policy and style distraction solutions and accountability. It's a challenging issue for public relations. Countering it with simplistic narratives with facts and rebuilding trust is key. I want to talk a little bit about the climate change. Now, the challenge with the climate debate, the biggest crisis I think we face as humanity, is at the moment it's focused on science and not the human issues related to society, let alone has it sought to build consensus through pub public relations. Here, we have three key opportunities. The science around the climate, climate change is highly complex and difficult to convey accurately to the public. Public relations around climate needs to find a way to simplify the, its story without distortion or dumbing down. Some remain, even today, skeptical of climate science itself. We need to respond with facts and build trust, but avoid alienation. We also have a role in representing the urgency of the situation, amplifying marginal voices, facilitating public discourse, and promoting a message of hope and innovation of the new technologies and business models that are helping reduce carbon emission and build climate resilience. Finally, we have a role in motivating behavior change. Public relations should promote policy solutions, but also encourage individuals to make sustainable lifestyle changes. This requires public relations to understand the barriers and incentives around behavior. I haven't talked, raised the issue of fake news yet, or misinformation, but this is a feature of both populism and climate, and it manifests as a corruption of public discourse in the following ways. Firstly, the spread of false and misleading information. Now we know the internet and social media make it very quick and easy to spread false news. This, this is based on fabricated news stories, doctored photos and videos, and conspiracy theories. There's also an aspect of manipulation. Misinformation can intentionally be spread to manipulate public opinion. And this is a concern I have related to AI. More on that in a moment. It makes it harder for people to make informed decisions. And finally, there's the issue of the corrosion of trust. Widespread misinformation reduces trust in mainstream news, government institutions, science, and fact itself. This creates uncertainty and confusion. It's a complex issue that brings together technology, psychology, and media literacy. And there's also the balance then of balancing free speech with pro the protection of democracy itself. I also want to mention AI. So AI has the potential to impact relationships and the reputation give your organization the license and permission to operate. It was siloed as a technology in product development in every organization until the launch of ChatGPT last year brought it out in the mainstream. Now it's firmly on every management agenda. It raises a whole range of risk issues related to data management and security. It's also a threat to jobs and skills. It could displace some roles, but equally new roles are likely to emerge too. And then there's also the issue of bias and ethical risk. 
AI systems reflect their training data or large language models. Biased data will lead to biased outcomes and problems with fairness, transparency, and un unintended consequences from automation. So you'd think we had a clear argument for public relations to realize its potential within in management. I would argue that the relationship perspective of organizations is as important as law and finance. So why isn't it that public relations practice is as significant or as valued and respected as legal or accountancy? I want to unpack some of these issues in my conversation today. Many systematic barriers to the development of public relations, such as the scope of practice, education, gender, diversity, and measurement, have been really well understood by scholars since the 1980s and even before, but there's seemingly little progress made in addressing these issues. Firstly, from the management perspective. In fact, management undertakes, and we just heard from a client, much of the public relations role, such as stakeholder mapping, relationship management, and risk, but it doesn't recognize it as public relations practice. I had a eureka moment when I read Robert Waterman and Tom Peters' McKinsey study that led to the book In Search of Excellence, published in 1982, and then also Jim Collins' book, Good to Great, published in 2001. These are both based on longitudinal studies of high and consistent performance in large corporations. The studies have been very, variously criticized for being simplistic and lacking in rigor, but it's notable that they attribute public relations to so many aspects of organizational success. Waters and Peters identify eight attributes of success that include the public relations task of customer engagement, internal communication, vision and leadership, and Collins cites vision and values, leadership, strategy, based on data and storytelling. These are all fundamental public relations tasks. Public relations tasks are part of management, but there's no formal preparation in management education or training for that role. I've explored this issue in a number of ways. The easiest is to go into a library, head to the management section and pull out a textbook. Look in the index for public relations. It almost certainly won't be listed. And if it is, it will be a subset of marketing or marketing communication. The book will include description of public relations tasks, such as a stakeholder mapping, relationship management, reputation and risk, but they won't be labeled as such. And the same issue is repeated in management and executive education. There are, however, moments when public relations is elevated within management. A study in 20, 2009 by Shannon Bowen, now a professor at the University of South Carolina, found that there are a small range of issues where management recognizes the need for public relations expertise. These include an organizational crisis, so crises allow us as practitioners to prove our worth and gain immediate credibility within management. Secondly, ethical dilemmas, so we're called to help organizations handle ethical issues related to external publics and that brings us into strategy discussions. We have the opportunity to earn credibility over time through influence within management. We're brought in to provide guidance when an issue hits the front pages, so issues related to a media agenda. And then we support leadership who seek public relations expertise to understand the public sphere. Now, I'd add to these situations some other area aspects such as financial uh, transactions, change and transformation as we heard from our previous speaker. And these findings are consistent, entirely consistent with a recent study of the public relations function by management consultant firm Deloitte. They also concluded that, depressingly, as soon as the situation has passed, typically the practitioner role and budgets reverse and this is the story of the role of public relations, unfortunately, during COVID. That elevation is returning to norm. So let's look at the barriers to public relations and maintaining a sustained role within management. Now, the first one, I think, is a confusion over the scope of practice. We just do not help ourselves as practitioners. 
there is no single worldview of public relations practice. And there's been various attempts by professional associations to agree upon a formal definition. In fact, Reg Harlow, a US practitioner and one of the founders of the PRSA in America, first reviewed, get this, almost 500 definitions of public relations in the 1970s. That must have been a hell of a mind-dumbing experience. The PRSA led a crowdsourcing e exercise in 2012 that resulted in the description of practice in, te technical t in tactical terms sorry, as a communication discipline. As a former CIPR president, um, I fall in behind the CIPR definition, which places an emphasis on behavior and reputation. Public relations is about reputation. It's the result of what you do, what you say, and what others says, say about you. It's the discipline which looks after reputation with the aim of earning understanding and support and influencing opinion and behavior. It's the planned and sustained effort to establish and maintain goodwill and mutual understanding between an organization and its publics. It's a strategic management function. The understanding of public relations in management, though, is exacerbated by confusion between public relations and media relations, publicity, marketing communications, internal and external communications. Now, these can all be part of the broader public relations practice, but no one of them defines it. There's also a range of alternative terms that are developed to describe the public relations function and its role within management to explain its application within organizational context. These include corporate affairs, corporate communication, management communication. There's about 25 different expressions, all of which are an attempt to rebrand public relations and it's wholly unnecessary. There's then the issue of public relations as a force of good or bad. It can promote mutual understanding or it can also promote, manipulate public opinion. I've, as, as I've started to, sit, to share uh, some of the outputs of my research work, it's often practitioners working in regulated industries or markets with challenging public narratives such as oil and gas extraction or mining that are most interested in its outputs. And that's where there's a relationship paradox at play between the environmental agenda and the use of natural resources. Environmental and social concerns are not part of any financial statement which has given rise to ESG, environmental, social, and governance concerns. It's also led to the creation of new report, reporting systems, but also a criticism of manipulation. My own water company in the UK, in the north of England, has beautiful ESG report, which you can download as a consumer from the website, but our beaches and rivers are also polluted with sewers, with sewerage. Apple's net zero mother nature video last week was launched in the same week that the iPhone 15 was launched. Doesn't make sense. I couldn't talk about public relations and management without talking about measurement. It was good to hear yesterday from Bayer about the alignment between business plans and communication plans. Communication objectives should be public relations objectives. Communication goals should be business goals. The outcome of public relations activity is typically not measured in ways that relates to organizational performance. As a result, management doesn't understand the contribution of public relations activity to creating organizational values. Practitioners typically count outputs or use proxies such as AVE, as a means of determining value. Where measurement models use, are used, they typically follow program logic based on achieving organizational objectives. The Amec Valley metrics framework is the best example of these, but similarly, balanced scorecards have been proposed as a way to assess public relations across financial, customer, internal, and innovation perspectives. It's really important work. Public relations is a, is a growing discipline, and it's great to see so many of us here today, but only of a, ma a minority of practitioners are skilled in practicing it in ways that management understands. We aren't qualified in terms that management understands. We don't adhere to professional management standards. 
There's no requirement for formal preparation in public relations education or training for a management role covering issues such as leadership, strategy, financial statements, or line management. Conversely, managers are trained in these areas. It's really interesting to note that India is a market, actually like many of the African countries, such as Nigeria and South Africa, where public relations is studied in a management context and qualifications are normative. And we really need, as a global industry, to learn from this perspective. So, how do we improve the value of public relations in management and what can we do about it? I've got another three or four years of work during which I've got to undertake an original research of, of my own, but I think there's three clear issues. Firstly, foundation and management knowledge. There are two broad roles within public relations. The practical role responsible for content and delivery and the managerial role responsible for planning and strategy. Public relations practitioners are typically promoted to the managerial role based on time served without any expectation of formal professional development or qualification. This issue is especially acute in the agency environment. And this characterization of the functional and the managerial role link occurs in almost every profession. However, in public relations, we uniquely fail to prepare practitioners both as they enter practice and then for management. In other disciplines, such as finance and law, there are well-established processes of onboarding or conversion from study and continuous learning, and that's really important. Second, public relations is an occupation that aspires to be recognized as a profession in pursuit of value and societal recognition. But only exceptional practitioners are qualified in terms that management understands and adhere to management standards. We have a chartered accreditation, but it's nowhere near as robust as the professions, such as accountancy or engineering. And the threat here is twofold. The lack of recognition and value, we all want to be paid more. But also the emergence of artificial intelligence. And a report published this week by the CIPR found that up to 40% of public relations tasks could now use AI to some degree, with the most integration being data analytics at 53% and social media management at 54%. Meanwhile, experienced users report a 15 to 25% productivity gain from using some form of AI tool or automation. And that's certainly consistent with my experience. Sorry. Sorry, the third, no, sorry, one more point. <laughs> Almost finished. The third point, my third point is the engagement with theory and practice, and this is the story of practice itself. So excellence theory, the dominant theory in public relations management in the 20th century is idealized. It's little known or applied in practice. I'm not even gonna do a astral poll of hands. The comparative excellence framework that sought to cries and develop the role of public relations in management in the 21st century is similarly little known or applied in practice. Theory and practice tend to operate as separate communities within public relations. There's limited application of theory and practice and vice versa. Events such as practice, which is why I'm completely blown away by it, that bring together the two communities are absolutely exceptional. In my view, we need to do these things, three things, build foundation knowledge of management, build professional standards and accreditation, and bring together theory and practice if we are to earn the attention of management and achieve a sustained role within the management function. I can't help but think from conversations such as those at the World PR Forum yesterday and practice today that we have a huge opportunity as a profession to realize our potential and build relationships with management, improve our reputation, and make our optimal and valued contribution to organizations. In 1999, my colleague, Dr. John White, presented a paper to the Swiss Public Relations Society that stated that the future of public relations was bright. He was one of the original team behind the excellence theory developed in the 1980s, so he knows a thing or two. He said, this though was dependent on practitioners recognizing the opportunities presented by the environment and management needs and taking steps to educate and then train themselves as well as making full use of public relations technology to provide reliable, if not indispensable service to management as they seek to deal with complexity and manage successful 
businesses. And I think that's a manifesto any world could get behind. I want to thank you for your attention and for listening. If you've got any perspectives at all to share as I continue to develop this work and studies, please, I'd love to connect with you and via LinkedIn and hear from you. Um, thank you very much. And I look forward to the conversation now with Kieran. That is correct. Thank you, Stephen. If you could just take your chair, I want to invite Kiran Ray Chowdhury, co-founder and joint managing director at ATDB Communications. Thank you. The first. Hi. It's really good. Yes. Well, do you want to drink of water? Okay. Yeah. Well, that was a really powerful session, Stephen. I think you've been, the whole point of not being appreciated by management or understood is fairly contentious and often frustrating for PR practitioners for sure. So in fact, I want to start with a question I'm just curious about. Uh, in the last three decades, uh, you know, you've done a whole lot of things. You've been a digital marketer. You've uh, sort of taught, you've, um, uh, you know, you've also facilitated mergers between agencies. Why did you pick this particular topic? Um, and why not something else? <laughs> <laughs> because I, I think we have such a latent opportunity that um, you can see, and, and COVID re-emphasized re this, um, we have such a latent opportunity to contribute within management. So many issues that management face relate to the external sphere and relate to public relations practice, but management doesn't necessarily recognize, sorry, management doesn't necessarily recognize the scope of public relations practice because we're siloed within media, publicity, marketing communications, or one of these areas as a tactical function. Yeah. And we really need to elevate that. And that study that, that I shared from 2010 found that what happened during COVID absolutely happens. And during COVID, we had this opportunity where management realized we need additional skills. We need them very, very quickly. So we saw this immediate elevation of practice, the need to represent the public sphere within management and to, to handle all the issues that, that we face, the public health emergency within a healthcare and public setting, and the reorganization of organizations, transformation and, and disruption. And public relations in it was right at the forefront in helping to do that. But unfortunately, it reverses as soon as the crisis reverses. Right. Right. So in fact, I'm going to start with a rather obvious question, which is, you know, you've seen so many shifts uh, in terms of uh, the communication landscape. So what are some of the major shifts that you can identify and actually relate them to the foundational change that even PR firms should be looking at undergoing to keep up? So I've literally built my career on disruption in the public relations industry. So I, I built an agency at the end of the 90s as the internet was built, being built out and the plumbing and first application layer websites were built on the internet. Uh, and so from that, I learned about um, the potential for, for new forms of media websites to disrupt communication and public relations practice. So that was the first one. Then we saw the emergence of social media, social media creating a new channel to reach directly uh, and engage with, with publics. Um, so that was the, the, the second point. Um, what we didn't foresee and what I don't think anyone foresaw at that time was the, the potential for social media to, to be weaponized in the way that we're only really just, just learning. Um, and we've got artificial intelligence now coming and there's lots of conversations about artificial intelligence. Discussed, it has to be said, from the threat perspective to our practice. I think that does a disservice. That's one issue. The bigger issue that we're missing is the management issue, the dis potential disruption. And we do this all the time in public relations practice. We look inward at the impact of things like the internet and social media on our own discipline. We don't look outward and consider what the organizational issues that are faced by these technologies. And I think AI is the next big existential issue. Um, the issue related to, to yes, to risk, 
yes to workflows, yes to, to um, certainly a lot of administration functions, but then also when algorithms are automated and some of the consequences you're going to find turn up. And that, I think, gives us an opportunity as practitioners, again, to have that conversation in management if we haven't had it before, to say, look, we can horizon scan and understand the public sphere and bring those issues into management. Right. So in fact, you've done a, you've co-authored a paper in November last year on the impact of AI tools. Uh, and you call it both good and bad, just like the internet in a blog post. So could you tell us more about the bad and then the good as well? It's yeah, got to be a silver lining. <laughs> so the narrative at the moment and for the, I'm picking up from conferences like this is, is focused on the human aspect of, of public relations and the importance of the human. Uh, and the fact you cannot replace a human with um, with a, a machine, and that's ac absolutely accurate. Um, there's also a big concern, um, you know, that we're, we're attaching um, we're attaching human intelligence to artificial intelligence. Think about the word artificial intelligence. It's artificial. It's not intelligent. We apply, we're applying a human construct to it. I think what we need to do is back away and think of it as a tool um, in the same way that we've used tools like the PC, like the internet, like mobile before it, and figure out how we can use it within, within our practice. Now, the big benefit, and there's lots of talk of generative AI, I think that's also a misdirection. I think some of the most exciting applications of AI with our, within our practice are reductive. So AI is trained typically on a large language model. Now, that large language model then gets applied to, to generate content. What we're not talking about is the use of AI to train on our own data, to understand large data sets and make sense of those. We deal as part of public relations practice with large amounts of data, public conversation, trying to understand conversations and, and, and issues related to, to, to the public sphere. AI helps us do that uh, in, in incredibly quick and smart ways. So um, I, would, I would urge any, any practitioner to, to look at these tools, embrace these tools, and look at how they can be incorporated within, within our workflow. And granted, then there is an absolute need for guardrails around this technology, just as there was around social media, just as there was around the internet. Uh, I was involved through um, industry associations in, dra in drafting some of the early guidelines for the use of social media, for the use of the internet in practice, for the use of e things like email for pitching. We need to apply that same sort of thinking and approach to, to AI and not get left behind. Um, yeah, and look at reductive because reductive AI is far more interesting to practice than generative AI. So, you know, you're right about the fact that the human is going to be very relevant uh, but how can the human, should, the human would need to change and skill and reskill to be more relevant. So which are the areas or what can organizations do to make sure that changing is being embraced and there's a culture of learning? What can be done to, and in which areas can, you know, PR practitioners therefore grow in? I think we're, we're so we're speaking to two colleagues at a, an event on at the forefront of public relations practice and education and learning is right at the core of this. I think this is the wrong answer <laughs> audience <laughs> on that question because you guys have already got it. You you figured out the need for con for continuous learning to be embedded as part of your practice. Um, it's funny. This is where public relations differs to other disciplines within other professional disciplines. Continuous learning is, is a normative part of what you do. So you wouldn't practice medicine, you wouldn't practice the law, you wouldn't have practiced accountancy without some sort of continuous learning. Now, there are practitioners, and they're in the room today, who are continuous learners and who do this within practice, but it, but it is by no means a compulsory part of what we do. It's sort of an optional nice thing to do. I think if you want to be a progressive agency, a progressive communication team at the forefront of what you do and have that relationship with management, you have to have continuous learning embedded in everything you do. You have to use competency-based models. 
to understand the skill set of a team and use those to set guidance for, for learning. And we have just had two days from, from the Global Alliance, you know, the Global Alliance competency framework, so a good place to start. And do you, do you anticipate a similar trend like AI or some other trend that's at the edge right now, but we should be looking out for, say, in the next three to five years? I think the, the big trend at the moment is AI. I think um, we didn't see that coming. Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, a particular concern with what's going to happen within the West, with the elections coming up, we know within the UK and we know within the US um, and the potential danger of AI to manipulate the public conversation. I think that's, a, you know, an absolute concern. And I think practitioners in every organization should be looking to put guardrails policies around how they use AI within their organization. As I say, there's a lot of good you can use it for, but also we've already heard um, that it does have negative implications. Sure, sorry, go and try and ask uh, one of these large language models to write a bio for you. Uh, in my example, it got, in my case, it got the first paragraph right, everything else was nonsense. Uh, in the case of a colleague, it actually wrote an obituary and said this individual was no longer alive, so unfortunate. Right. Before I finish, uh, Steve and I have a rapid fire, uh, some rapid fire questions for you, but please, your answers can be leisurely. My questions are going to be rapid fire. So the first one, strategy or execution? Oh, I think you've got to have both. Sorry, I'm, I've got a bit one or the other. No, you don't. Yeah, I think you've got to have both. So you've got to have strategy and then... Excellent execution. Okay. Teaching versus consulting. What did you enjoy more? I think teaching is part of the consulting role. I think so often within um, consulting, um, we think we're going to go in, or you're engaged, a consultant is engaged to go and fix a problem. What a consultant should actually do is go into an organization and help that organization recognize the problem um, and then educate them to deliver the solution themselves. Right. Let me add another element to this. Being a student. Sorry, sir. Being a student. How do you enjoy that? How do I? You, being a student, you've gone, gone back oh, to... Oh, so uh, it's been wonderful to go back to school, actually. Um, um, I'm a bit of a fraud in, in my own public relations practice. I stand up on stages like this and I talk about continuous development and lifelong learning. Actually, I'm an I'm a engineer by training, um, which possibly explains why I've pushed into the technology aspects of public relations, but I haven't got a formal qualification in public relations myself. This is an effort to go back to school and get that qualification that I need. Right. And what would be your favorite brand, which is a PR success, according to you? Oh, goodness me. There's so much good work being done by practitioners um, around the world. I think the brands that do really good work are the authentic brands we heard from, from our first speaker. Um, I, I also watched that Apple video, and I'm a complete Apple fanboy. I've got an Apple watch. <laughs> I've got an Apple phone. Um, and I'm afraid I also winced um, hmm. because of, you think about the mineral extraction that goes into building an, an iPhone or an iWatch, and it's, you know, it's terrifying. And I thought that wasn't authentic. I think the authentic brands are the ones that, that um, truly engage with their publics um, through listening um, and uh, tell, a, tell an authentic story. Um, and I have to say, my favorite brand, and you know, it's an organization I work with is the NHS in the UK, because I think it absolutely does that. It has some of the most excellent communicators uh, who, do and, who have done an absolute world-class job. And what do they do right? Why are they your favorite brand? Um, sorry, it's the health service in the UK. Um, they, um, um, you know, just the, the work that they did during COVID that was done by colleagues, I think was absolutely exceptional. Um, it's not, you know, not, they aren't as properly supported as maybe they should be by the government in the UK, but that's another story completely. And what's the most abused word in PR? As the most you. abused, <laughs> outreach. <laughs> outreach. Let me outreach you. <gasps> okay. So many abused words. We make up. So this is the thing we do. We make up so much. Uh, we make up so much nonsense 
um, to describe what we do when actually we should just keep things really, really simple. Right. And must watch movie for any PR professional. Oh, goodness me, I wouldn't know where to start. Sorry, I'm going to have to take a pass you on name that. Name a couple. Oh, pass? Okay. So, oh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't. Breaking Bad, probably, but that's not, it's okay. a story about business models rather than a, a st West Wing. The West, yeah, the West <laughs> Wing, I suppose. Um, um, some absolutely exceptional communicators in that. Yeah. And must read book? Uh, my own. Um, <laughs> Amos book. Amos book is, Amos, actually, if you want to understand public relations yes. and management and communication, my book's a good place to start. Amos book is, is on my, um, it's a cabinet to read yes. next. Yes, Pursuit of Reputation. Yeah. Um, um, yes, so this, um, the Nowhere Office, uh, Julia Hobsbawm just published about the, I've just read it, trying to understand what's happening um, as we return to the office or do we this hiatus between the office environment and working from home. Um, also a really good book. Okay, lovely. So Stephen, that's it. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. It's been such a privilege that I got to do this. So thank, thank you, thank you. you everyone. Before I go, can I get a selfie with you all for my mother? She will not believe. I'm from a small village up in the north of England. Yeah, um, let's, let's make this interesting. If I can just request all of you to take your phones, turn on your, your flashlights, please. And that way it will appear up really nice. So everyone, especially folks at the back, just turn on, take your mobile phones, turn on your torchlight. Let's really make this an awesome picture. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Kiran. Oh, yeah, yeah. One picture for certain. Absolutely. <laughs>